Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director of the Milken Institute's Center for Regional Economics, Kevin Cloudon. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is going to prove to be another enthralling and exciting day at the Milken Institute Global Conference. I would like to welcome you this morning and uh, to say that I have the distinct pleasure of introducing and welcoming the 39th Secretary of Commerce of the United States, Secretary Wilbur Ross. We've had the uh, pleasure of working with Secretary Ross in my role as Chair of the Trade Finance Advisory Council, where we've worked uh, to promote exports by small and mid-sized U.S. companies. Secretary Ross has shown himself to be a steadfast and, uh, and effective champion of U.S. exports, the U.S. economy, and U.S. And US international trade relations. He's uh, going to be speaking this morning where he is being interviewed by Andy Serwer, Editor-in-Chief of Yahoo Finance. Thank you, everyone. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, I would just want to thank uh, Secretary Ross for coming here today. Uh, obviously, there is a tremendous amount on your plate, Mr. Secretary, so we're very grateful that you're taking the time to speak with us. Well, it's become a habit being interviewed by you, Andy. Well, thank you. Um, so let's just start off uh, with the news, and that is that uh, late yesterday afternoon, the administration announced it would delay an imposition of steel and aluminum tariffs on uh, Canada, Mexico, and the EU. And I guess the question is, what prompted that decision? Sure. Well, we, had, we have imposed tariffs on 180 some odd countries, essentially every country in the world. The two major trading relationships in the Western world are Canada, Mexico, and EU. We've been trying to work with them a mechanism for accomplishing the same purposes or more than the tariffs would have accomplished. And we've made enough progress thus far that it's worth investing another 30 days in the process. Um, doesn't it, I'm going to push back a little bit. I mean, you know, there are people who are saying that this undercuts your position, um, that, that you're picking winners and losers. How do you respond to that? No. Well, the purpose of this is not winners and losers. The purpose of the 232s is to deal with the problem of steel and aluminum overcapacity and overproduction on a global basis. Those are threatening our national security by possibly interfering with the ability of those industries to supply what the economy needs. That objective hasn't changed. We're a little indifferent as to the exact way we achieve the objective, but the objective has not changed and will not change. My understanding is that you're on point, in particular, Secretary Ross, with the EU, and that you've been getting them, this has been reported, that you've been getting them, trying to get them to reduce tariffs on U.S. cars, and generally trying to get them to reduce their trade surplus with us. The EU has reportedly responded by saying, we don't like to negotiate with a gun to our head. Has this been the tenor of the, the discussions? Well, I think the details of any negotiation are better done in the conference room than in the press room. Um, but Not my job, uh, come on. We'll, we'll know the end result when we have an end result. Okay, and, and you know, then they're talking about blue jeans and Harley Davidsons and whiskey and all that, right? I mean, it, you know, this could be a problem all across America, right? Well, these are wide ranging discussions, but again, it's a work in progress. We don't have a definitive solution as we sit here. And just a, another question or two about the EU. The president seems to want to have bilateral discussions where the EU says, you know, listen, we're bound together and you can't just talk to Macron, you have to talk to all of us. How do you resolve that impasse? Well, as a legal matter, as a formal matter, and as a practical matter, the EU is the trade negotiator for all of the 20-odd countries 
within the European Union. So there is no ability to have a separate discussion on this kind of issue simply with a Germany or a France. We did have very active discussions both with President Macron when he was in Washington earlier this week uh, and with uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, in her visit on Friday. Right. And again, with regard to this bilateral um, versus trade pact question, um, there was talk at one point, and the president suggested maybe the TPP was something he was interested in. And I know that um, Japan is interested in the U.S. coming back into the fold there. Is that a dead issue, do you think? Well, first of all, we have a little bit on our plate right now with the two 232s, the 301 on intellectual property, NAFTA, and China. So there's a little bit of an issue of bandwidth, how many of these discussions can you handle at any one point in time. But more importantly, when the president decided to drop out of TPP, there was not going to be a TPP. In the fall election of 2016, neither Hillary Clinton nor President Trump was in favor of TPP. And there was no political appetite for TPP in the Congress. So it's a little bit of revisionist history to say, oh, oh, but if it weren't for President Trump, we'd be in TPP. Not true. Okay, fair enough. So taking a step back, let's look at the, uh, the broader picture here, Mr. Secretary. It's been roughly three months since um, President Trump first um, decided to have tariffs on solar panels in Washington. Right. That sort of kicked things off and was actually, I guess, 2018. It seems yes. to be the year that you guys wanted to start this up. Um, <coughs> essentially beginning this campaign to sort of reset trade. Right. So how are things going? How would you assess how things have, have uh, where, where we are? Well, you probably have seen there have been announcements of solar plant fabrication facilities opening up in the U.S. That's quite in contrast to the sky is falling theory that a lot of folks had when we were talking about putting in the tariffs. And in fact, in 2017, 3,353 companies reshored to the U.S. That's a 52% increase over 2016. So it's already starting to work that we are between the 3,000 odd new businesses starting and 52% more reshoring. That's what the president wants. He's about jobs in the U.S., job creation here. So there may be things, certain companies and certain people, workers, that are hurting because of trade imbalances, but aren't you concerned net-net of creating more harm than good by all these new policies? Farmers, for instance. Well, they, they keep saying about the farmers, we certainly are not trying to do anything to hurt the farmers. Farm prices have been very bad for the last few years. Farm industry has had its economic problems, so we're very sympathetic to that. President also made clear that he's instructed Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue to use the powers of Agriculture Department to try to help the farmers <coughs> in the event of retaliation. But the president has a couple of underlying theses. Number one, when you're the one with the big trade deficit and you're negotiating with the guy with the big trade surplus, he has more to lose than you do. Second, no country buys anything from us if there's a cheaper way to get the same quantity of the same quality from somewhere else. So to the degree that they constrict our exports to them, they're going to raise their own cost domestically. And in some cases, not going to be that easy. Take soybeans. That's the usual example. Right. Brazil already supplies a majority of the soybeans that China needs. We supply a little over 30%. For Brazil to replace us in terms of the Chinese market, they would have to increase their soybean exports to China 
by 60%. Well, guess what? If they could sell them 60% more right now at a competitive price, they would do it. They're not holding back just to benefit the U.S. So that's an example that it would probably cost them more in terms of the Chinese cost. And there's a question, could they really get the supply? If Brazil did sell them more, most likely it would have to come from some other market that they're now serving. Japan is one possibility. But if that did happen, A, they'd probably have to pay a premium to convince the Brazilians to give up a historic customer. And then C, it would open up that market to the US because the people in that market are still going to want their soybeans. So I think this is not to say there wouldn't be any pain if we do get into tit for tat. There will be. But the idea that it will be some sort of Armageddon and everything will be horrible is simply not true. Similarly, washing machines. There was a big woe is me when we put the tariffs on washing machines. Well, guess what? Both LG and Samsung are now expanding quite rapidly in the US their washing machine production facilities in the southeast hasn't been tragic at all. And bottom line, so then net net, you believe what you're doing, of course, will benefit more companies and individuals than it would hurt. We do, but we, we also believe something else. If you don't take some risks and if you don't show that you're willing to absorb a little bit of pain, how on earth are you going to get things changed? If you just do nothing, which is what the prior practice had been, we know how that turns out. That turns out more and more and more trade deficit. That's not acceptable to this administration. You mentioned China, and I want to talk about that for a little bit as well. But before I do that, I want to ask you, again, this guy has so much on his plate, about NAFTA. Um, and you have a deadline coming up with Canada and Mexico, uh, I think in a week or something like that. How are those negotiations going, Mr. Secretary? Well, like any conventional trade negotiation, they started out with the easier topics to deal with in the hope of building some momentum, getting people invested in the process, and then deal with the more difficult and more complex and more important issues later on. Well, we're now in that later on phase. And as a practical matter, either we'll have a deal within the next few weeks, or it probably won't be until the fall, and who knows what happens then. The reason for that timing is Mexico has their presidential elections early in July. Canada has the provincial elections in June. We, of <coughs> course, have our midterm congressional elections in November. So as you move toward the middle of the year, the political calendar is going to make it very, very difficult for any of the countries to accomplish something as, as complicated as NAFTA. All right, let's talk about China. My understanding is that this evening, you, Secretary Mnuchin, Robert Lighthizer, and Larry Kudlow are decamping to Beijing right. to begin to talk to the Chinese, or to talk more to the Chinese, I should say. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday that said the Chinese are going to push back on two things that you're looking to accomplish. One, to have a target of reducing the tra their trade surplus by $100 billion, and two, to reduce their investment in the China Growth Program 2025 into high tech. Um, is that, in fact, the case, and how do you proceed then? Well, apparently, the New York Times has developed psychic powers because I don't believe that the Chinese have made that announcement, and we certainly have not either. Okay. All right. Well, I, don't worry. I have a lot of other questions about China, Mr. Secretary. Um, so you say that Chinese tariffs are only represent three-tenths of one percent of GDP, and you call that hardly life-threatening, or you, call, you characterize right. it that way. Right. But certainly they may escalate. I mean, isn't this, aren't we on the cusp, perhaps, of a huge set of risks when it comes to China? 
it's a question of choosing your risks. Our trade imbalance has gotten worse so far this year because while our exports did pretty well, they were up something like 6.9%, but our imports went up something like 10%. That means we're having an expanded trade deficit. That's a problem, and we're trying to reverse that trend. Do you buy this theory that we have a trade deficit with China because Chinese, the Chinese consumers save more and then the investments come in terms of buying U.S. companies, whereas we don't save and we buy their goods? You've heard that theory before, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I have. Well, first of all, part, a big part of the reason the Chinese population saves so much is they have very little in the way of retirement benefits, post-retirement health benefits, things of that sort. There's not much of a social safety network out there. So they need to save more than Americans do. We have a lot of saving that's been substituted for by various government and other programs. So it's a different economic thing. Second of all, if you look at the realities, does anyone in the room think that China's trade surpluses weren't very good for China? Does anybody think that? I don't see a lot of hands no, going I don't see up. Any. Yeah. Well, if trade surpluses are good, is it mathematically possible that trade deficits are equally good? Does that make any sense to you? I don't think it does. Chinese business people I talk to ask, why doesn't the United States just go through the normal mechanisms of the WTO? Well, using the word normal mechanism in WTO, I find a little oxymoronic <laughs> in that WTO is an obsolete set of rules. It's a set of rules that has been more or less created to benefit exporting countries to the detriment of importing countries. There is a need, I think, for some sort of impartial arbiter of trade rules. You need some kind of enforcement mechanism. But if you look at this, say, 2016 annual report <coughs> excuse me, that the WTO put out, it's filled with complaints. My gosh there are more trade actions that have been brought this year than ever before. And they lament that as a protectionist thing. It apparently never occurred to them that the reason there are more trade actions being brought is that there are more violations of trade rules than there had been before. So that mindset that anything you do to enforce the rules is inherently protectionist is something with which we have a fundamental and very philosophical disagreement. The Chinese say they want to buy more stuff from the United States, but then it seems like it's tech stuff or things that sort of rub up against national security, and then they point to the situation with the company ZTE. Right. Is that a fair assessment? Well, two different aspects. ZTE, uh, we put big fines on them and more recently put sanctions on them simply because they were violating repeatedly the sanctions against both North Korea and Iran. Both North Korea and Koran Iran, I think a hundred times to our knowledge, they violated the sanctions. Subsequently, they provided very misleading information as we were making the settlement that fined them something like a billion dollars. So we felt under the court settlement, we had two further options. One was to fine them another 300 billion, but since, uh, 300 million, but since the first fine didn't really seem to solve it, we thought we'll have to take the other sanction to which they had agreed in the court proceeding and that was to cut them off from the export to them of sensitive uh, high-tech material. Okay. Um, so sort of following on that, can trade issues be linked to national security issues, let's say, like Korea? Well, they are. Uh, think about it. 
economic security is national security. And if you don't have economic security, you're not going to have national security. And the enabling legislation under which we brought the 232 actions specifically makes that linkage. I mean, it's, it's great to hear you sort of suss all this stuff out, Mr. Secretary, because sometimes people think we're getting foreign policy via Twitter. And so there's a, there's a depth of negotiation going on behind the scenes that Americans and people around the world probably don't see, correct? Well, there's a limit to how much detail you can get into on 160 characters. Hear, hear. Um, I, I, one last question about trade, and then we'll go on to space, which is another oh, subject you're interested good. in, I know. Um, and that is, you, an objective is to have, if not free trade, then fair trade. Yes. But isn't that a unicorn in the garden? I mean, does it really exist? And what, what's the absolute goal? Well, um, you talk about unicorns in the garden. When I was in Davos at the World Economic Forum, I was on a panel quite dominated by uh, so-called free traders. And so at the beginning of it, I said, I'd like to ask you a question. And my question was, if the United States is not the least protectionist country in the world, please tell me who is. And you know what? They had no answer. Okay. Um, space, the final frontier. Um, so you talk about the Commerce Secretary, uh, excuse me, the Commerce Department is now a one-stop shop for space. What does that mean and why is this under your purview? Well. Space comes naturally to us. Some of the media seems to think the whole administration is in outer space already. <laughs> so it's o only natural that we would <clears throat> want to commercialize it a mm. bit. <laughs> um, wow, okay, fair enough. Um, okay. That was a good line. So uh, I think you said, Mr. Secretary, that I, I want to know how you got into spa interest oh. in space. And you said, I think, that rocket launches are communicable disease from which there is no cure. We get into it, in other words. Yeah, what, what I meant was we've been going to some of the launches, and they are really exciting things to watch, and they are incredible demonstrations of our technology. You saw the one where Elon Musk shot off his little red convertible and it's now just about orbiting around Mars. That's an incredible feat. But even more important, two booster rockets that got this enormous thing off the ground, two booster rockets were recoverable by design. So they literally separated at some high altitude from the main rocket and the payload and went right to two landing spots, maybe a half a mile from the original launch. That single breakthrough is going to change the economics of space because so much of the cost is in the booster rockets. So these rockets had then been used for the second time. More recently, I believe he used them a third time. Another company has apparently used the same ones eight times. Well, think about it. If you take a big piece of your capital expenditure and you can now amortize it over five or eight or ten units rather than over one, you're really changing the, the dynamics. So the cost of space is coming down. And the developments are becoming huge. Uh, Richard Branson, uh, through his space activity, has gotten 600 people from 50 different countries each to prepay $250,000 for space tourism shot, a 20-minute journey into suborbital space next year. That's $150 million of activity. And it's small compared to what's already going on in space. Space right now is about a 340 
billion dollar a year business. And we think it won't be that long before it becomes a trillion dollar business. But um, 70 countries are now doing something or another in space. 1,500 companies were started last year solely to do something in space. So it's now becoming a very global, uh, very competitive phenomenon. So President Trump created the National Space Council under Vice President Pence's chairmanship. I'm on it. And the Space Council has been recommending that, and gradually are implementing, the Commerce be the facilitator of it. What do we need? Remote sensing. That's what lets your GPS work. It's what, what lets a lot of things work from satellite. Remote sensing regulations have not changed much in 25 years. But when you think about how satellite technology and remote sensing has changed, they're not remotely the same. They're much more sophisticated, much more complicated. We think that the pace of regulatory change needs to accelerate so that it can match the pace of technological change. Similarly, right now, when a military rocket gets launched, they only evacuate a very small area at Cape Canaveral around it. When a commercial one launches, they evacuate practically the whole place. That's very disruptive, very expensive. It's due to archaic regulation. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's impeding uh, the activity that we have. But my most fascinating part is the concept of the man in the moon is going to become a gas station attendant. And what I mean is this. In order to get most economically big payloads, colonization or big material, to Mars, it would make sense to first go to the moon and then refuel there. Because the journey to Mars is a much longer journey than to the moon. And because the moon doesn't really have gravity, the thrust that it takes to launch from there is much less than what it takes to launch from Earth. So it's an interesting concept, and the moon is well set up for it in that for rocket fuel, you essentially need hydrogen and oxygen. Well, those dark spots on the moon are ice, ice that's been there for a long, long time because they are permanently dark. So you can break the ice down into the two components, you have your fuel, and off you go to Mars. Wow, what a concept. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fascinating and obviously informed take, uh, and interesting. And you mentioned Richard Branson, and Elon Musk, there's Jeff Bezos, there's a lot of brain power. Oh, yeah. um, and maybe coupled with the government, we can really yeah, get some stuff Yeah, and the great there. thing is, in the US, a lot of this is being done privately. And that's one of the other challenges. Our competition in space is China, it's Russia, and then it's all the rest of the world. So our private sector, in effect, is competing against subsidized government projects elsewhere. Uh, finally, uh, that's, that's really interesting. And the, the last question I want to get to, though, is our next panel coming up is the Goldilocks economy. Will it continue? So, Mr. Commerce Secretary, I ask you, will the Goldilocks economy continue? Well, first of all, I don't like the Goldilocks name because we don't intend this economy to be eaten by a big bear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear you on that. <laughs> but I think there are lots of clear signs the economy is doing very, very well. New businesses being formed, capital expenditures, consumer confidence, uh, reshoring of activities, the deregulation, which I think in many ways has been even more important than the tax and the tax itself. Who would have thought that over five million American workers would have gotten a thousand dollar bonus or increased retirement or a specific benefit solely due to a tax bill that was passed? If anybody had asked you a year ago, is it conceivable that American industry would do that? 
could say that's nuts, never going to happen. If they got a tax cut, they'd just put it in their pocket. Well, they didn't. And that message is coming through to average people. I think it's why consumer expenditures grew even more rapidly than uh, consumer disposable income. It's because people are feeling more confident about their job security, more confident about the future, and you see it also in corporations. So I think that economics is not just numbers. A lot of it is the psychology. And if people are feeling better and more confident, you can go a long, long ways that defies the fact that it's been a very long, albeit until now, very slow recovery. Great. On that note, Mr. Secretary, I'm going to let you go off to China to represent our interests. Thank you very, very much for your time. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that was a terrific, uh, I, I think we could say, wide-ranging discussion we had there. Um, and we're going to continue the conversation with a terrific panel that's going to be coming up here in just a minute or two as we get some more chairs on the stage. And I'm going to start off by talking to these people a little bit and asking them to bounce off of what um, the secretary had to say. But uh, as I said, he definitely has a lot on his mind and a lot to deal with. And uh, we wish him well. All right, so without further ado, I think are we ready to get the next panel up. Um, as I said, it's will the Goldilocks economy continue? Um, and if we could bring our panelists up on stage. Welcome. So we have Steve Krustos, Governor Hickenlooper. I'm not sure where you guys want to go. Do they come around here? All right. All right, so let me do some, some good introductions here. Sorry about that. To my far right, is Tom Hayes, who's the CEO of Tyson Foods. To my immediate right is Ken Hirsch, who is the CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center and a veteran in the oil and gas business. <laughs> to my left is Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado. And to my far left is Steve Kruskos, who is the Global Vice Chair of Transactional Advisory Services at EY. So welcome, gentlemen. Great to see you. Thank you. I take it you heard uh, what uh, Secretary Ross had to say? Most of it. Paying attention? <laughs> okay, good. So let me start with you, uh, Governor, and ask you uh, thoughts on what the, the Commerce Secretary had to say, and what are the impact uh, impacts of uh, possible tariffs and sort of a changing trade landscape with regard to businesses and individuals in the state of Colorado? So we have a, uh, an economy that is oriented strongly towards different types of trade. Obviously, it's very important for agriculture. The Secretary made some reference to that. Uh, you know, I look at it from a larger perspective. Predictability is one of the most essential ingredients of, of growth. And the, the, the risk here, and, and I think there's a legitimate question of how great is that risk that the, the kind of wild fluctuations in people's expectations and what they think is happening, you know, our Major trading partners are, are uh, Mexico, Canada. Uh, China is a large trading partner. We export a lot of aerospace and technology. We're a center for GPS. We also export a tremendous amount of agricultural goods. And in many cases, especially in ag, uh, as the Secretary mentioned, they've gone through, a, you know, the last several years, four years, really, they've gone through declining commodity prices already. And to begin taking away additional markets that had been negotiated is you know, I think uh, unfair. Let me go over to you, um, Tom, and ask you, you run a big ag company. I guess it's safe to characterize as an ag company, right? Well, uh, Tyson Foods, so yeah. yeah, so we start with agriculture, but go all the way to dining culture, $40 billion food company. And like the governor said, I mean, there's not, a, not anybody in our company that's anxious to see, you know, more burdens put on, you know, the agricultural food community. Uh, but it is complicated. You know, I think that there could be, you know, seen as winners and losers, you know, the manufacturing sector may be gaining from some of the activity and agricultural losing. But uh, we got some really smart people working on this, you know, uh, certainly Secretary Ross is on, on the, the, uh, the game, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, what I think is most important is that we just get through this time of uncertainty. 
You know, that's, that's the big thing is people want, as the governor said, to have stability. They want to have predictability. And that's what we're hoping for as we come through this period and find ourselves uh, back to work on the things that matter. You have these proteins, chicken, obviously, and pork. Are you seeing any change already with regard to um, your business in China? I'd say there's a little bit. We uh, can't say too much as it relates to the impact. We have earnings on Monday, so <laughs> we had a bit of a quiet period. But what I would say is that we have seen some movement, and overall, uh, not, not too, too much. We want a free trade for sure, so to be clear, you know, whether it's NAFTA or China, we want to have, you know, access to those markets. They are important markets to us. Uh, but in terms of sort of the near end impact, not, not so much, uh, depending upon where it winds up ultimately, uh, there's a real, real matter. And so, like I said, that, let's get through what right. we have to negotiate in order that we can get back to business. Ken, what are your thoughts on um, what the secretary had to say? Well, I think today, and I'll speak from a macroeconomic per, uh, perspective, um, I think we, we are in this sort of Goldilocks moment. Um, but I think that our risks today are sort of above ground. And there are things that we uh, know about and we live with, and we're, we don't really focus on them until they really jump up and bite us. So the things that business needs to move forward, obviously clear policy around trade and immigration, um, taxes, we've gotten that out of the way. And so I, I do think that, the, that those risks, if we really want to achieve 3% growth to really overcome the kind of the fiscal cliff that we put in place, we really need to focus on um, making sure that from a policy standpoint that we're coordinated. What I worry about is that when we think about trade, trade in China uh, is one thing. Tackling that at the same time that you tackle NAFTA makes it more difficult. North America as a block can compete wholeheartedly. I, with, with China, we've done a ton of work on this, the Bush Institute, and you, you combine Canada, the US, and Mexico as a block. We have more resources, we have a great market, we have great talent, we have great supply chains, you name it, that is a great competition. To, to call that into question at the same time that you want to stand up to China to really create more fair trade, I think that's the, that's the, the piece that is missing in my mind. Right, so you would say, let's have coalesce NAFTA and then tackle China. Correct. Right. Interesting, okay. And Steve, I want to ask you um, your thoughts on what the Commerce Secretary had to say, maybe as it pertains to your business. Well, you know, <clears throat> if you think about the M&A business, what is remarkable to me is that we're sitting here through a record four months of activity and the outbound activity or the cross-border activity from China to the U.S. has been at such a depressed level. I mean, who would have thought that we could have had a record four months with that? Now, you know, look, I think that's a lost opportunity uh, for the U.S. I think there's capital in China um, that can flow here. I think if you look at the technology market in China, you know, e-commerce in China is bigger than Germany, U.S., and U.K. put together. Um, so I think this is something that I hope will get, uh, you know, will get worked through with the upcoming talks and, and uh, you know, as Tom points out, more certainty in the equation, less uncertainty would be, uh, would be a good thing. Um, we talked earlier today, uh, earlier this week, I should say, Steve, and you suggested that you were fairly optimistic when it comes to the Goldilocks economy and that um, you thought we could continue. Yeah. Merrily along, why, why, with that, without the, the three bears eating us or whatever that, that <laughs> why, why is that? So look, I, I think that um, <clears throat> you know, the underlying U.S. economy is, is in a very good place. You know, I, I look at the first quarter GDP with a grain of salt. You know, I think that there is um, uh, you know, a lot of anomalies in the first quarter, in any quarter for that, for that matter. Um, you know, when I look at the strength um, uh, you know, of the labor market, the level of unemployment, when I look at, you know, where oil prices are going in the U.S. now as a, as a net exporter of oil, um, you know, I, to me, all of the signs um, are, pointing, are pointing north. The U.S. is the preferred, you know, M&A destination for nearly any country around the world um, that, you, that you look at. So, you know, look, I, I don't discount uh, the uncertainties around trade. I don't discount the risk of interest rates rising too high too fast, right, which, um, uh, w which could upset the apple cart a bit. But, um, you know, generally, the U.S. economy is in a very good place. And um, I'm certainly seeing 
activity levels that, um, that are very positive, manufacturing levels, every company I talk to, very optimistic about the horizon. All right, the U.S. economy is in pretty good shape. What about the economy of the state of Colorado? <laughs> We're doing great. I mean, the, tell us about it. We went through, you know, eight or nine years ago, we had some real struggles. We were 40th in job creation. And U.S. News and World Report came out a couple weeks ago and said for the second year, we're the number one economy uh, in the country. And that's largely a balanced economy. In other words, agriculture, even with low commodity prices, has maintained its strength. And we've diversified that economy into things like cybersecurity and emerging markets. Uh, healthcare has become a big part of our Colorado economy as well. And so what about going forward, though? Well, again, the uncertainty is a, is a real issue. And I think that it's great to look at a, 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 and have an aspiration towards a 3% growth model. Uh, I think that's important that, you know, to go beyond the, the Goldilocks a little bit. But you have to look at the risks. And at a certain point, uh, if you have a recession and, and, a, and a massive recession, uh, something comes along the line that, that upsets that equilibrium, uh, you lose, you go far beyond what, uh, what you've gained by going from, say, 2.2% to 3% for uh, a few years. So I think there's got to be some level of moderation. In a funny way, if you think about it, the w technology has allowed us to have less and less inventories. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is in many cases unfortunate, but we have a labor force now that is you know, many people are underemployed. They, they, they get extra hours, they get less hours, which is another uh, way that l businesses are able to control costs in anticipation of a recession. So ideally, we should see less severe recessions as long as we don't have something like a, you know, a banking crisis or something where the, 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 the playing, playing field is uh, manipulated in some way that really sets everything on its end. Right, so you're saying that inventory can be controlled more tightly, and the same with workforces, so that should mitigate the impact of recession. Right, that's a tr Could traditional economic theory. That's a big part of what causes recession, right? As you right. build up inventories, you have to too much labor on, on your books, and suddenly you've got to adjust to that when sales go down a little bit, and that creates a, you know, a spiral that creates a, a, a significant recession. That used to happen every seven or eight years, right? It looks like maybe there's a way to do that uh, and have the recessions be much more modest and, and maybe not as frequent. And then I pointed out that there are other things that are new, like derivatives and you know, mortgage-backed securities that are created that are also dangerous to the system now. But those are different, not structural, <laughs> right. Um, Tom, let me ask you, you um, are concerned or interested, I should say, in NAFTA as well. And what is your take on that? And, and how is it important for Tyson? Uh, NAFTA is very important. Canada is our fifth largest trading partner, customer, I'd say, and uh, Mexico is number three. So for Tyson, it's a very important, very important issue. And uh, there's a theme that keeps coming up here, which is certainty, and that's what we're focused on. We want the agreement to be modernized for sure. There's a lot of things that can be, uh, can be done differently. And we know that with the electronic age, we need to be more digital and we need to have commerce flowing a lot more easily. I think uh, the thing that concerns me a little bit is the sunset. So if we are going to be back at this, you know, every five years and creating the same uncertainty again and again, that to me is, is not helpful because we have to have relationships that are built on trust and structure and, you know, just commerce flow that are mutually beneficial to the extent that we're revisiting, you know, again and again, that, that's a little troubling to, to us. And I'd say again, you know, for the uh, trade to flow, we need to have you know, certainly uh, the focus on having this be good for both sides, and uh, that, is, that is important. And deficits, nobody likes to be in a deficit situation. However, we want to continue to try to make the best result for everybody, which is not easy. Uh, I respect the work that the, the, the uh, team is doing on it, but the NAFTA for not just, I would say, overall uh, Tyson, but the food industry is very, very important. You know, it's interesting how um, different issues become the focus of um, the economy and the media, too. Um, and, you know, you don't hear about health care, right. and that's a huge issue, right, with a, with a workforce of yours. It is. Health care, um, I would say employee benefits overall. We want a you know, value proposition for the uh, team members that they want to join our company and stay with our company. Uh, the governor talked about labor and the, the fluxes for us in a very a labor intensive business. We're trying to make it a bit more automated. So we've taken a lot of this tax savings and we're investing it in more uh, CapEx. 
to automate the most difficult jobs in our company and train people. So there's a, there's a lot of good that came out of the tax uh, reform for sure. And uh, just to repeat what uh, Secretary Ross said, also regulations are very, uh, what has been done with, uh, you know, holding back some of the regulation uh, that is on the industry is helpful. Uh, food and food related products is already a very heavily regulated industry. So uh, that encourages us to invest more. And so I think that the employee experience will be better by capital investment and just allowing, you know, companies to, to run. Or, you know, I, I think, oh, go ahead, please no, jump in. I, was gonna, I think deregulation is a topic that probably doesn't get enough attention. Right. Right. When you look at the amount of deregulation that we've had under this administration, there has been a very positive impact on business. Ha, is, has there been a lot of deregulation or has there been talk of deregulation? I think there's, I think there's been a lot. Yeah, there's been, uh, so just for the, the food business, there's been some things that were contemplated in the prior administration that have been uh, stopped or held back. I think that's a big one. And there also has been some deregulation. So uh, all of that is uh, music to our ears and because we feel like we do a really good job as it relates to keeping consumers safe, team members safe. And, uh, you know, frankly, we haven't talked yet about the environment, but that's a big focus for Tyson is making sure we do more with less. Ken, uh, Steve says it's all uh, rose-colored glasses out there. <laughs> You're a little less optimistic. I mean, you two guys want to just have a smackdown <laughs> in terms of exactly how rosy the picture is out Well, there? I, I'm just a little more cautious. Um, the, uh, there's some headwinds that are forming, and I think that I'm not talking about the stock market. I'm really, I'm really talking about um, probably two years out after the full effect of the tax code sort of gets worked, the tax cut get worked, work through the system and that becomes a new normal. But what I see is uh, an increasing, a dramatic increase in consumer debt, um, an, an increase in corporate debt, higher or worse uh, credit ratios and less covenants throughout the bond market. Um, those, were, those are sort of canaries in a coal mine that eventually um, comes, comes back in some manner. You combine that with lower productivity gains and uh, a full employment uh, we can talk about underemployment and participation rate, but we have over six million jobs that aren't filled. Um, eventually, we're going to really see um, a labor pricing move um, that is going to be contractionary. So I, I look at this and say it's not all perfect. Um, and then you add things that are uh, that everybody knows about, like a, a 1.5 trillion dollar student loan market that's that's not really healthy, um, and that's about the size of the high yield market. So you know, as they say in D.C., things are impossible right up to the time they're inevitable, <laughs> and and we know that these markets are loading up again on debt. And at the same time, we've added 1.5 trillion dollars to our debt load, and and so those are the kinds of things that over time are a drag, and. You can deregulate a little bit and you can lower taxes and those things help, but sometimes what they do is they, they borrow from the future. So that's where I think the, um, that's where I see the, 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 the most attention, the least attention today, and when that comes into to really the, the, the near term is when we're gonna have a significant question. And then the question is, can we make hard decisions? Can we raise taxes? Can we cut benefits? Can we deal with the mandatory part of, of the federal budget? Those are all contractionary things. And I do worry that we don't have the, um, we don't have the stomach to do that uh, when, when the time will come. And one thing also that you didn't mention, I don't think, is, is rising interest rates too, right. which sort of changes the whole complexion right. so of you, everything you've yeah, talked you about. Yeah, you start refunding the federal debt at, you know, at 3% instead of 50 basis points. You know, it's a, right now it's 7% of the budget. And, uh, it, that starts to that starts to grow, and and those things you can't touch, right? And and if it starts to be called into question, then we're really going to see a significant uh, sort of realignment uh, around capital markets. So I think that that nobody's outlawed the business cycle, as far as I can tell, and we're really kind of long in the tooth. And so there's been some good headwind by the new administration um, on certain issues, but I do worry that that the that the increasing debt levels are going to come home to roost at some point. Give you some numbers on that long in the tooth. We just ended April, 106 months of expansion, the second longest on record. So that's why we're talking Goldilocks here, people, <laughs> right? Just how long can we go? Um, Governor, over to you. I, I want to ask you about um, the tax cut, and um, people seem to be positive about it, but is there a cost to it? In other words, you just cut taxes, and wow, we were wasting all that money. <laughs> well, the question is, um, and, you know, even on this panel, 
how that tax cut get, you, gets used. And I think, you know, investing in capital is important. Is that going to, in, in some cases, that's going to eliminate jobs, right? And that's going to be a, a, a complication as, as well. My biggest concern with the, with the tax cut was it seemed to borrow a tremendous amount of money from the country, right, from the future generations. And then all of a sudden, within a, a very short period of time, we have the biggest, you know, the spending expansion that we've seen. Where I come from, that's, you know, that's unhealthy. And somehow that, that piper is going to have to be paid. And we have to begin looking at, you know, what's that, what are the consequences to that kind of debt? At, at a certain point, the federal government's not going to be able to deal with its obligations. Uh, and that, that should concern everybody. Does this impact the state in terms of uh, funding and what you can do? Yeah, it, it means that things like basic infrastructure, again, if there had been some provisions within that tax cut to incentivize the federal government's partnership with states and with regional entities, right, metropolitan areas, to build uh, transportation infrastructure on one side, one type or another, making sure we have broadband in every town in this country, I mean, those kinds of investments, I don't see how we make them now when we've kind of larded up the system with these gigantic, and the tax cuts, you know, 30% of, of our market, of our stock market is owned by people outside the country. We just gave them, we borrowed money to give them a, a, a really happy holiday, right? I'm not sure that's in the best long-term interest of the country. But, don't, but I mean, don't businesses benefit from the tax cut? And that, doesn't that help our economy? I mean, just to... Oh, there's some, that. there's a, definitely, without question, short-term benefit. Mm. Uh, but I think most of the CEOs of large companies I've talked to would have been happy with a you know, that they might not say it publicly, but instead of going from, you know, 35% down to 21%, maybe if they ended up at 24% or 25%, kind of more in keeping with some of the European countries, and put those resources into infrastructure or something that would long-term make sure their business could grow and have, you know, real traction in, in terms of that growth. I think most, not everybody, there are exceptions to every rule, but, uh, many would ra rather look at that long-term uh, you know, long growth. So it's a question of degree we could have done here and... Well, I think that, yeah, exactly. Right, right now we're using a, a meat cleaver and we're making mm -hmm. these decisions in, in kind of right. gigantic slices and there are going to be consequences, right? Right. I, I, I think <clears throat> I agree with you. Infrastructure is a very important uh, topic and, and it's one where I think the U.S. has got a long way to go if you compare to some of the Asian countries, China, Singapore, uh, actually the whole ASEAN region, Australia, right? I, I think the U.S. can take a page out of the playbook, so to speak, in terms of what those countries have done to stimulate economic growth with infrastructure investment, but not necessarily from government, from private funding. Um, and I know that's an uncomfortable topic, right, for some <laughs> people, um, but there really is economic stimulus, and you look at the results of what's happening in some of these other places, so I don't think it has to be all a tax answer for infrastructure. Yeah, I think infrastructure is something that makes Americans unhappy and angry with Washington and frankly maybe with the states as well because can't you guys just get along and, and fix this bridge? And it should, I mean, if there ever was an issue that would appeal to both parties without question and so it's just a mystery to Americans why we can't get these things done, right? And it's just, it's, it's difficult. Um, Steve, back to you and I want to ask you about um, m and your, your line of work, and are you concerned that this whole, um, you, it's been very positive, but it's going to start to dry up? I mean, particularly with regard to China being able to do business in the United States, do transactions. Well, I, you know, look, I, <clears throat> I, I am optimistic, and we've been saying this for the last, you know, 12 or 18 months. I, I think there's a few drivers of the M&A market right now that are not going to necessarily um, slow off. I mean, one is, you know, the advancements we're seeing in technology are causing companies to really rethink their portfolio of assets. And so we're sort of in this era of portfolio transformation where companies are buying and selling much more regularly. And you see that in a lot of the headline deals. That's not going to stop because technology is not slowing. Um, secondly, you know, despite populism, technology is making the world a smaller place. And so we're seeing more cross-border activity. I mean, we're seeing companies, I think 60% telling of, of the companies we talk to saying they'll do more cross-border deals 
you know, next year than last year. Uh, and third, I think private equity is, is really in a long-term structural uptick. So, I, you know, I look at all that, I see the risks, but I also see upside because I think as tax reform works its way through the system and companies get their hands, um, you know, better around the legislation, it's very complicated, we'll see an uplift there. I'm, I'm also hopeful that we'll see an uplift in the medium to long term if we can get the infrastructure uh, equation figured out. So, um, you know, look, you're always going to have, I think, a, you can always have a down month or a down quarter, um, but I think we've got to stop thinking about the M&A cycle as a boom and bust kind of market. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing I think that potentially keeps us from having a record year this year is the regulatory environment and antitrust and, and some of the challenges on, on the bigger, uh, bigger transactions. Go ahead, it, sure. Well, yeah. I, uh, Steve, I think that from a transaction standpoint, I think transactions, as the world sorts to a new normal, you're going to have an increase in transactions. And I think you're getting capital put to work. But I worry about the macro level um, that we haven't talked about. We are, we are entering, I believe, um, kind of a technology cold war. And I think as we... Technology cold, cold war. war. And, and I, think, I think we have institutional frameworks that were set up kind of post-World War II to really manage physical movement of, of goods and services around the world. And now you have this technology overlay that has, is a huge factor in business planning. And it's borderless. So the institutional framework was set up all wrong. So now we don't know what to do with it. And you add cyber to the equation um, and then add the national security elements to it. And I think that this is sorting out in ways that we're not used to. So I think we're, in a, we're really in uncharted waters. We're, we're, we're moving from sort of this global, this period of sort of global peace and prosperity where everybody was playing the, the game of freedom, democracy, and capitalism. And now we're saying, now people are saying maybe regional sphere of influences are better. And so you have China asserting itself in the Pacific, you have Russia asserting itself in Eastern Europe, you have Iran asserting itself in the Middle East and, and the US and, and Western Europe. And, and that changes supply chains and that changes logistics and that changes politics and regulations and you name it. Technology moves so rapidly. That, so to me, there, there, there's, a, there's an exogenous risk as to how this plays out and how people think about their business that may not be the normal, that may not be the most cost efficient, but it's what they have to do. Now that'll drive your business, which yeah. is great because you're <laughs> gonna see lots of transactions, but in terms of just where that growth is gonna come from, I don't ignore the, the impact of this of sort of global, this global realignment um, that I believe is happening and, and how that uh, manifests itself throughout the economy. It's one of the big issues of our time, right? The, the, the bright side and the dark side of technology. Mm -hmm. And Tom, let me ask you about that because obviously you have to pay very close attention to technology and you need to invest in technology and it's kind of an arms race looking at your competitors. They just did this with their plant and their supply chain. How do you keep up with that in that kind of environment? Yeah, so I haven't thought about it as a technology cold war. But <laughs> that is a new way for me. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, it's a there, scary it, over it here. It's definitely a race, oh, and that's something that we are uh, we want to be you know front runner in. Uh, but I want to do I do want to come back to the the tax cut comments because yeah, sure. mm -hmm. to the extent that uh, we do not grow, and then of course it's going to be for naught. And so that uh, I am cautiously optimistic by nature, and so I feel like we will have the growth that we need. Uh, but that's what we're focused on as one company is using that money to make sure that we are growing more jobs. So maybe the jobs uh, won't be as manual, but we, we are going to be a net, you know, job creator. But as it relates to technology, that is something that we feel like it's, uh, you have to be optimistic about because it is going to change and change massively, not only how we do business, but also how we do it in a more sustainable way. One example is we are very involved in blockchain. Uh, so blockchain really? technology. You guys are. We are. Yeah, have done uh, some, a lot of work on it. Mm -hmm. And there's a, uh, you know, you can, uh, we're not uh, necessarily opining on cryptocurrency, but blockchain itself as a technology, uh, very helpful for things like forecasting. So you know where piles of inventory are around your system and they can take working capital out. They can create flows that are uh, seamless with customers, trading partners. And so to be on the edge of that, that's something that could be helpful in terms of getting waste out. And uh, certainly uh, digital. We have a company that was sort of born analog, a lot of you know, paper and spreadsheets and so forth. And we are moving to you know, digital in a big way and cloud. And that will you know, then also put us in a position to be more aggressive as it relates to our growth agenda. So I think 
Uh, those things, we were doing them anyway before the tax cuts, but certainly uh, we are able to accelerate some of those investments, which are important to continue to propel growth. Tom, um, just to follow up a little bit, so what would you look to um, the federal government for to best help your business? In other words, if you could, ha if you had a wish list, yeah. I wish the federal government would do X, Y, and Z. Nothing. Get out of the way. <laughs> Get out of, way. <laughs> Stay out of our way. Uh, Get no, away I, and I let think, me sell my no, protein. I, 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 I absolutely yeah. do think there's, um, there's the right balance. I, I, I'm a very, uh, I'm focused on balance. We have to balance our supply chains and we have to have the right balance. And we want to make sure that we don't, uh, we have to have regulations so companies don't run away. Uh, we've seen, you know, that sort of certainly in the news as it relates to information technology. And, you know, at the same time, we have to make sure that we're doing things in a prudent way. I like the idea of, of having a healthcare system that's, that works today. We, certainly we don't have that. And we want to be in a position where we want to be, you know, not just a company that's contributing to uh, the growth of the food business, but the growth of an overall, you know, strong American economy. And so um, the government can be helpful in some ways, and I think that tax cuts are an example of that. And certainly they can, you know, do things that uh, put us in a, a more difficult position and uh, not to be too political, but I, I feel like from a business leader's perspective, it's good to have that right balance is the way that I'd put it. Okay. Shifting gears a little bit, Ken, I, wanted to, I do want to talk to you about the oil and gas business. Um, it's always front and center, and um, today is, of course, no exception. And it's interesting, we were talking before, and you told me that the whole notion of lower oil and lower gas prices used to be a net, net clear benefit for the U.S. economy, um, and you have oil and gas in your state, obviously, is no longer the case. In fact, it may be a negative. Well, I, I think that uh, when you think about the United States that today is producing about 10.2 million barrels a day, um, which is second in the world only to Russia, um, that we are a major oil producer. Um, and uh, as Steve said, we actually export both refined products and crude oil now, given the price differentials between the U.S. and uh, the rest of the world. And so it used to be that, that low oil prices were great for, the, for a, 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 such a consu consumption-oriented economy, um, but now it is a major part of our manufacturing base. If you look in the numbers in, since 2009 to today in the, in the recovery, if you, if you X out the U.S. oil and gas industry, you would cut that growth rate by a, about a half. Um, and that's a... It, this was a this is a huge uh, you know kind of a, a huge transformation in our economy that's happened in the last in the last ten years and it's not just three states that produce oil and gas anymore you, there's there are thirty states that produce commercial quantities of oil and gas um, given the shale revolutions and so it's 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 happening um, and so do you you it brings up infrastructure questions on how do you get the right supply to the right places if because we're not just importing from our shores we now are producing from from uh, from the center of the country, and so those are the that's the transformation that's happened, and it's really quite exciting, and it's been a result of entrepreneurship, and it's been a result of trial and error, and it's been a res and it's and it's had to navigate and survive massive changes. If you think in the last 15 years of volatility and global politics, so now we're in a situation where we we uh, geopolitics sort of flares up, and all of a sudden oil prices go up, and that will be a drag on the consumption part of our economy, and so I think that. That these are, you know, it's it's a it's a much more complicated equation now. It's also very exciting. It's a very important industry in the United States, and it's something that uh, that if you don't appreciate the value of it at a basic kind of manufacturing level, then you're missing something. But it is complicated. Like this guy over here likes lower fuel prices. Right. <laughs> we do. Yeah, and, and lower fuel prices and lower transportation costs. Uh, it's not so something that's been working. Uh, in our favor. But maybe many of, of your, your customers costs. may benefit, may, some of your customers may actually benefit yeah, and yeah, increase sure. demand. Yep. Right, then you can <laughs> say, yeah, that's you sell more proteins in, in those right. states, yeah. right, where there's... There, if you have yeah. strong economic growth. Yeah. And how's your oil and gas business doing? It's doing very well, and I think, as we see, have seen this amazing transformation, it's one of the great revolutions that I don't think has gotten the media attention it should, this whole notion of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. It's, oh, there have been some stories about that. No, no, I know, <laughs> I, I know, but I think, Right. The, the magnitude yeah, right. of that yeah. of that innovation and, and transformation, yeah. the effect it's had on yeah. chemical industry, you go down the list. Yeah. And also even on regulatory, right? We were, yeah. three years ago, four years ago, we were able to sit down with uh, the largest uh, oil and gas producers in Colorado and then the, the uh, environmental community 
and put everybody, you have each side put in their scientists and spend 13 months, sometimes like herding cats, sometimes like having cats and dogs in a bag. Uh, but in the end, we, we set, create a set of methane regulations and my commitment to the oil and gas industry, industry was no red tape and bureaucracy. Every dollar spent would actually make the air cleaner and that they would share credit. And to this day, when I talk to the executives of those companies, it, I mean, at the end of that process, we had a, a press conference and, and both industry and the environmental community were side by side saying, this is progress, we're glad to see this happen. I'm not sure it would have happened if we hadn't had this resurgence of oil and gas in, in the United States. And I think now the question is, how do you get those regulations which are pretty efficient, not just in the, around the country, but around the world? And I would compliment Governor Hickenlooper as a, as a Democratic governor in a purple state. He has been the model for getting industry and the public concerns around environment together for a rational approach. Um, you should be congratulated because it is it, what you did was was not only symbolic; it was important. And um, you've done it a phenomenal phenomenal uh, job in, in on that topic. And as a result, the state has benefited. Yeah. What do you think about that, Tom? See, is that your government, I, 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 nice I, government I, I, at work right there, right? Yeah, no, I absolutely love it. <laughs> you know, we have former Governor Mike Beebe uh, from Arkansas on our board, mm -hmm. and the idea of public-private partnership. I do think is gaining steam. I think there's, you know, when you have uh, the impasse that we have as it relates to our country on, you know, the political front, uh, it takes leaders to step up and sort of just, you know, grab the ball and, and run. And I, re I really appreciate that. I think that's excellent work and I would encourage all of us to do more of that. The thing that <clears throat> is very exciting is that everybody continues to have optimism, even though, you know, we are, I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people, even though we have a lot of you know, sticky issues to deal with, which is generally always the case. Right. All right. You talked about regulation, regulatory change, Governor. I'm going to talk to you about a big one in your state, and that is weed, <laughs> marijuana. <laughs> okay. And it's legal in Colorado, so let's talk about this. And I know you were against it, a Democrat against marijuana. I mean, come on. Um, you were against it. Um, but now you've kind of come around a little bit because it seems to be working. Can you talk about how um, your thinking has changed? Sure, and I, I was against it and in almost every state where it's been legalized. Most elected officials have been against it. A, no one had ever done it before. Even Amsterdam just decriminalized marijuana. They didn't create a whole regulatory framework. Second, it's in conflict with federal law. That's never a good idea. Uh, third, you, you have unintended consequences. We were very worried about seeing a spike in in consumption, and especially a spike in teenage consumption. We thought we'd see increases of, of visits to the emergency room, worried about people driving while impaired more frequently. And to a large extent, most of those fears haven't come about. We do a, a poll of 20,000 people uh, a year to look at, you know, how much, who's smoking, how much marijuana, and especially with teenagers. And we saw a slight increase immediately after it was legalized. But then it came back down, uh, you know, right about, just about to where it was when we began. And there, there are other smaller polls that, that uh, I don't think are, are as scientific that say, oh, well, it's been up 6%. I mean, it's been, we haven't seen a spike, and especially among teenagers. And, you know, people say, well, you get the tax revenues. So we, we do get, we got about $200 million last year. We're a $30 billion budget, so $200 million is not going to provide you know, uh, early childhood education to the state or, or any, anything significant. But it does allow us to put more money towards law enforcement in terms of enforcing, trying to cut back on the black market. We still do have a black market of, you know, the industry is 1.5 billion. We have a black market of 50 to 100 million. Uh, although I point out to people 20 years ago before we legalized medical marijuana in, in 2000, it was all a black market, right? So we, we were sending literally hundreds of thousands of kids to prison, making them felons for nonviolent crimes. Uh, I think the key is, and I tell other governors this, that we haven't seen these, these spikes in consumption, with, with one exception, senior citizens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whether you think it's baby boomers coming home to roost or whether the, you know. What's wrong with these seniors? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, maybe right. they find it as, as a, a more successful pain medication against arthritis and the, and the pains of growing old and opioids. But anyway, all of that, when other governors ask me, should they do this? I, and my answer is, if, well, if, you're, if your citizens have, have voted to legalize it, then I think you've got an obligation. But if they haven't, 
I advise people to wait a year or two and let's make sure that there are not more unintended consequences that we haven't been able to see yet. This is, I mean, if, if states are the laboratories of democracy, this is, this is going to be one of the great experiments, great experiments, one of the great social experiments of the first part of this century. Follow-up question. How do you reconcile uh, the fact, though, that it's against federal law? You know, that and was... You can't bank it, you know, there's the banking system, there are these problems, right? Yeah, so we now have some small banks that have been willing to bank it and take that risk, uh, credit unions. Uh, so most of it is now banked in Colorado. One of our fears has been that the new administration will clamp down on that banking, which just pushes us into a cash industry. When you've got a $1.5 billion industry, if that were all cash, you know, if you wanted to try and incentivize corruption in the legal marijuana business, make it all cash, right? I mean, that's... So I don't think that's going to happen. I've met a couple times with Attorney General Sessions. He's clear that he is against anybody doing more drugs of any kind in this country. But he also recognizes that his priority is going to be heroin and meth, human trafficking. These are all much larger, more dramatic issues. You know, we don't, people forget this, but there's no record of, of, of anyone dying from an overdose of marijuana, right? And yet each year, 35, 40,000 people die from alcohol. Five to 10,000 people die from over-the-counter or non-prescription drugs, like, I mean, aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen. People have special conditions that make them vulnerable to this. You know, marijuana, in many cases, is, seems to be, not that there aren't problems, I'm not a... Yeah, people crash their cars impaired with marijuana. Absolutely, no question. But okay. A fraction compared to alcohol, but, okay. but you're, I mean, we have, but the thing is, we have $200 million, so we, we spend millions of dollars every year marketing to teenagers that this is a bad idea for them, and marketing to, to trusted adults that for teenagers it's a bad idea. And we also market a, that even, even the least amount of THC in your system makes you a risk on the roads, and you're, you're just you're, you're crazy, and we're going to throw the book at you if you violate that law. And then there's private employers can mandate that you not smoke. I mean, the, you can't play for the Denver Broncos and smoke marijuana, right? I don't think you can. Right. Well, but think about it. We don't have people showing up at workplace drunk or very, it's right. pretty rare. Right. Once you lay out the framework of how this right. thing works, uh, again, we have had a couple of court cases that were supported in the state Supreme Court that an employer has the right to say they want a drug-free workplace, and right. that has been upheld to the highest level. Right. And how does this fit in with the Goldilocks economy? Well, it's a, for better or for worse, it's a growth part of the, of the U.S. economy, I guess, right? I, I spent last week in Amsterdam, and I can tell you it's a big part of their economy. Right. I was gonna, no, I was going to segue gently to you and ask, like, are you seeing, is there... Goldilocks are high. Right. Yeah, the Goldilocks high, okay. Um, are there business deal? I mean, you see these, you know, all these little bitty marijuana companies out there. Has it risen to your level? Do you guys um, do deals with marijuana companies? Is it, will that happen? Uh, you know, we, we've been approached around uh, assisting on a couple of investments. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, so I'm going to just have a clean break and ask you about Europe about and that. your business in Europe because there's no, no more segueing to be done, I think, with <laughs> marijuana, perhaps. Um, and so, and so, are you concerned about what's going on with the EU? And you know, again, this is another breaking point, maybe that could impact this Goldilocks economy. What's going on with the EU and them looking to cut ties? Yeah, look, I, um, <clears throat> I think maintaining uh, trade with the EU is going to be critical. You know, as um, Prime Minister Blair talked about yesterday uh, during lunch, I think there's still a lot to be played out around Brexit. Um, not as concerned about the first quarter GDP in the UK as maybe some people are because um, actually there were some pretty significant weather events in the UK. They may not seem like significant weather events to us in Chicago or New York, <laughs> but they were for the UK. Um, and they also had a very robust fourth quarter. So I think the UK is actually doing okay. I think there's a lot to play out on Brexit. You know, Angela Merkel got her uh, coalition government. Um, you know, Macron seems to be doing a, you know, a nice job in France. I mean, I think Europe is in better shape uh, than a lot of people um, are, are saying. I think they're going to be very careful about monetary policy as you move forward. You've seen Senator Draghi's comments. So um, no, no doubt the EU is an important part of the, uh, of the world economy. We've actually seen it, you know, strengthening and more activity there and um, hope for that to continue. Great. Tom, let me ask you about your global business. And, you know, is it just exports? Do you look to partner? Is it M&A? How do you see your global footprint increasing, and how does that help your business? Uh, so I, it's uh, all the above. I want to come back to marijuana. 
No, please, I didn't ask you to weigh in. We want, we want people please, to be <laughs> because it helps people <laughs> eat more. with their appetites. No, no, we want people to be high on pro protein. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah, okay. We, no. Sorry. The, uh, I'm not sure how it affects the oil and gas business, but okay. Food, so, yes. Food, food uh, yeah, right. so we're uh, the largest uh, U.S. food company uh, for, by sales, $40 billion in sales, and about 10% of our sales is exported, so $4 billion ish of exported sales. They uh, generally all over the world, uh, hundreds of, of different countries. And we do have operations in China. We have three plants in China. We have two plants in India, but those are very small businesses. And so our focus is on growth. So you can imagine that as we look around the world about where protein is being consumed and since 1960, 3% every year just continues to improve that we look at those countries that are eating more and eating more protein, and those are the ones we're also focused on. So uh, there is a, a big, you know, as, as it relates to our strategy, looking at international growth. And we also believe we have a lot yet to do here in the U.S. You know, we will grow through uh, acquisition, and we are growing organically at the same time, which the governor and I talked about this backstage. That's something that, you know, is really uh, on our minds is doing both simultaneously. And so, in as far as um, your production plants, they have to be sort of local, right? I mean, you can't. I mean, you can't. You you do have those exports, but in other words, you can't export jobs. Yeah. So if you go all the way back to the start of this panel, we talked about the agriculture economy. U.S. is the best agricultural nation in the world. You know, Brazil is is strong. China certainly. Uh, but we export totally uh, about $150 billion worth of goods, you know, from the U.S. to other countries. And so uh, those assets that are in the U.S. are highly productive. We have uh, low, low costs. So we actually can be competitive exporting. And so uh, we also know that in-country operations play a role. But uh, we can compete uh, globally fairly well. $4 billion is not you know, uh, a huge number, but it's relatively large, and that we feel like there's a lot of upside uh, to it to the extent that we have open trade. Right. <laughs> Ken, I can't let you go without asking you uh, about um, how uh, George H.W. Bush is doing and the Bush family overall and George W. Bush. Um, can you give us an update in uh, the sad passing of, of Barbara? Um, Pre President Bush enjoyed coming to the Milken Conference last year um, and supporting the work of the, of the Bush Institute, um, which uh, is an important uh, part of his port personal portfolio in making sure that, that uh, principles around economic and political freedom are sort of ha have a home um, in, a, in, a, in an important place. Um, as I've been there a couple years now, it's been a, an honor to, for me to really uh, gain a, a deeper appreciation for what public service looks like and what principled leadership looks like. And nothing is more evident uh, than the, um, both President Bush's and, uh, and Barbara Bush as well. So uh, he's in a good place right now. What, they, what's, what you've seen publicly is what, is what it is um, and, and how he's doing. Uh, the, uh, the Bush family and what they stand for, the, the decency around public service and the sincerity with which they serve um, was on full display um, at, the, at the memorial service. And it was a real, it was a real um, expression, I think, of what's good in this country. So it's been an honor for me to, to kind of be inside the ropes and see it up close and personal, but it's, he shares it uh, with, with as many people as he's able. Uh, and he, I think he's in a very good place right now. And, and like I said, he coming to the Milken Conference last year was, was were the kinds of things that he enjoys doing um, in addition to painting. Right, right, good. Glad to hear that. A lot of family stuff to deal with right now, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Life. Good. All right, over uh, to you, Governor. And I want to ask you about um, some more politics, and that is um, the midterms coming up. Um, what's your take? A lot of people are predicting doom and gloom for the GOP. Anytime people predict things with that much certainty, I tend to think that's <laughs> not going to happen. So uh, what's, your, what's your thoughts? Well, I think if, if Democrats around the country maintain their focus on, on specific issues, uh, and I think there's, again, Democrats are always going to have a priority around civil rights and social justice, but it's also got to be about jobs. And, and there are strategies to make sure that we do have a, a, a growth in the economy and that we are able to raise rise, raise up uh, people's uh, wages. I, I think if that's focus 
stays, uh, I think they're going to do very well. I think, you know, there's a level of tribalism right now in both parties. And I think the media probably, not, not, not specific media, well, local, local media exempt, but that, that encourages that tribalism. We're not without fault. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put that out there, believe me. But I think the tribalism will, will be very much in play all over the country in the, in the congressional, in the midterm elections. Okay. And what about yourself personally? Ever thought about running for president? <laughs> you know, it's funny. We have so much going on right now. A lot of what we've talked about is workforce training and, and, ha and labor force. So we have apprenticeships and we're partners with Microsoft and LinkedIn to do a skills-based platform. The moment I start talking about 2020 or, or anything beyond, not only am I distracted, but my cabinet gets distracted, my senior staff gets distracted. We're, you know, I've got whatever it is, 253 days. I've got a little counter on my cell phone, but <laughs> we're going to finish strong. We're going to do everything we can to make sure we get as much completed before we finish. Great. Well, good luck to you on that. Oh, and let me ask you just one last quick question, Ken, and that is, maybe it's not quick, but I want you to do it quick, <laughs> um, which is, are you concerned about um, our geopolitical strategy in the Middle East when in regard to Saudi Arabia and Iran and oil policy? Uh, y yes, but not as bad as it used to be because we don't rely upon that much uh, supply coming to our shores from the Middle East. Today we only get about a million and a half barrels a day from the Middle East um, that, that actually comes to our shores. So it's really freed up our foreign policy. We're not as captive to just making sure that we don't upset the oil markets uh, as a consumer, which has really liberated our foreign policy. And now um, I hope the policymakers are able to navigate that new environment. All right, lightning round, Goldilocks economy, will it continue? Will it continue for the foreseeable future? Yes. Yeah, I think it's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Well, we got 106 months. I'm not going to ask you to, to put months on it, but let's remember that. Uh, mm. Two years. Two years is my, uh, I get nervous. And the protein business? Do no harm on trade? The answer is yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to leave it right on that note, that happy note. Uh, please join me in thanking this great panel, Tom, Ken, Governor, and Steve. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Nice to meet you.